I just wanted to welcome everyone to uh, to our final tasting this evening, uh, our final Italian uh, week four on our tour of Italy, the Giro, Giro d'Italia. And we're very grateful to everyone who's come every week, obviously. Uh, especially grateful to our friends from uh, our, our guests. Obviously, we had Matteo Scary in week two. Uh, we had um, Paula from the Machina last week. And this week, we have the great pleasure of a good friend of ours, Dario Podana, who, uh, who is one of our one of the most knowledgeable people I know of, of the wines of Italy, but most specifically, he, he worked for many years with the wines of Masciarelli and Valori, two wineries that we're going to be trying this evening. So uh, welcome there, Dario. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. And of course, welcome to Alastair Cooper, MW, from London, who's calling in from London this, on, a, on a gloomy London morning. And um, we, I just thought I'd put in quickly here. So we're actually doing a little, a little welcome, a little thank you to everyone. We'd love to know, get get your feedback, get all of your feedback about what was your favourite wine, because we really have tried a very, very diverse range of wines over this last month. I can't believe it's been a month. It's incredible. And we've gone through, I mean, we could, we could go for another year, to be honest, but in the last four weeks, we've really gotten down to uh, the centre of a lot of the really, really famous regions. And I, I for one, but, you know, we're, we're very, very keen to know what were your favourites, basically. So we've got uh, a little, all we need you to do is, is, if you're interested in winning a bottle, just text your name and the, the wine that was the favourite. So you'll see just here, we've put up all the wines over across the last the last three weeks. And obviously, we've still got three wines to go. So uh, if you want to hold on till the end and text in the end, just to make sure you haven't you haven't finished uh, the, the course just yet. But if there was one that absolutely blew you away completely, you loved it more than anything, please, please just send us a text with your name and the, the name of the wine. And we're going to draw at the very end at 7.30, we're going to draw someone's name at random and you're going to get a gift of that bottle for, uh, for, for putting your name in the hat there. So that's a little thank you for you. So I believe we've got absolutely everyone here now. So just going to... My chat doesn't seem to be... All right, so let's get started. Now, we've got, uh, Luke, have you got your little map ready to go? No, I don't. Okay, that's fine. We, we have a little, we, <laughs> we tried this a little earlier today, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, it, was, it wasn't the most perfect thing in the world, so we might, we had a, a Google, Google map, it was like a video that took us from, from Tuscany to where we're going uh, to today to across to Abruzzo. However, when we tried to do it, it was uh, it wasn't the most perfect video because of the, the the internet, the way the internet was working. So we might we might just skip over that for now because I think it might be a bit of a disaster. Instead, I'll show you the very oh, there we are. presented still map that's not going to not going to screw up. So obviously, we were in Tuscany last week. We're throughout uh, throughout Tuscany and San Giovese was king there. Now we're going to drive across the central Apennines, the central Alps, from and, and we go kind of almost due east <coughs> from Rome to the region of Abruzzo. And there's also a little of Le Marche as well is, is, is also we're going to talk about because it's quite important and quite interconnected within Abruzzo. So I'm just going to, I'm going to throw it across to Ali and then we're going to talk to, to Dario about Abruzzo. So I've got a little map here of, of the region of Abruzzo. You can see up in the top corner there the, where we are within Italy. And then uh, just keep it, I, I didn't want to take that number away. So the text's there if you want to keep texting your, your name and, and the, that wine in there. But I'm going to throw across to you there, Ali. If you okay, want to great. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's, thanks, Mark. I'm going to give a little brief 
Um, very brief snapshot of Abruzzo. So Abruzzo is a region I'd never been to um, before last year. And then I was lucky to go twice within six weeks, both times to see my good old buddy Dario who's joined us tonight. And it was a region that actually completely blew me away. And it's also, even to Italians, probably not the best known region. Um, and I remember Mark and I jumped in the car from Rome. We'd come from Germany, jumped in the car from Rome, drove northeast towards Abruzzo. And we went through the Apennine Mountains, which was just absolutely stunning, past the Grand Sasso Peak at almost 3,000 meters above sea level, where you can ski, so only about an hour and a half away from Rome. And then it's a very rugged Adriatic coastline. So um, you go up these beautiful hills, beautiful hilltop villages, and down to these sprawling, long, beautiful white beaches. So first of all, geographically, it was a region that totally blew me away, and it's a fairly cheap region to visit as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the food as in the rest of Italy. So the seafood from the Adriatic coast is just incredible. The best saffron that there is that comes from, from Italy comes from there. The best lamb, white truffles, porcini, you know, what's not to love. So it really is a beautiful, well, it, it's a bit of a best kept secret. So don't tell anyone else, uh, <laughs> otherwise they'll all start going to Abruzzo. Um, in winemaking terms, I think it's probably fair to say that it's been a... Um, an underrated region for many years. Um, it's a fairly large region, 100 kilometers from, from north to south. I think the key thing here is from a quality wine perspective, there's a lot to play with in terms of the cooling influence of the Adriatic coast. And then of course, those huge peaks that we talked about. So that allows altitude and also diurnal temperature variation to, to maintain freshness in a lot of the wines. Cold, cold winters inland, if you're thinking up to 3,000 metres above sea level, that will make sense. The key red grape here is Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, which we'll, which we'll get to shortly. The key white grape is Trebbiano d'Abruzzo, and probably third, third most important, and probably the highest quality, we'll see what Dario says, is Pecorino. Pecorino is also a cheese, so the Italians have, have complicated things as they normally do. Pecorino is a cheese and a grape variety. Um, Montepulciano is a grape uh, and it's also a region in Tuscany that makes some fantastic Sangiovese. So as we've talked about, they do like to complicate it with, with our things, but this <laughs> has nothing to do with Pecorino, has nothing to do with the cheese. However, it does go very well with the cheese. So um, I think we'll talk about Montepulciano and Pecorino bit more when we get to them so I'm going to swing over to Dario now and and hopefully Dario maybe you can tell us uh, you know a brief introduction to, to Masciarelli being the, the GM and um, and then you know introduce this wine. Thank you Ali thank you everyone so yeah uh, I'm really excited today to explain Abruzzo to a let's say a broad audience because it's not something that happens so often being Abruzzo as Ali was mentioning a kind of kept secrets, a bit too well kept secrets, because <laughs> nobody knows the place. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, ma many times when they ask me, where, where are you walking? What do you do? So I start explaining about the region and I see lots of question marks and faces. And uh, yeah, you need to explain a little bit where, what happens over there, because uh, Abruzzo is blessed in a reason, in, in a way because it's really unspoiled and untouched. It is a region of Italy with the highest biodiversity recorded and with the biggest diversity on climate in a very short distance. Because as Ali was mentioning, we have a wonderful long coastline and really high mountains, some of the highest mountains in, in Italy and in Europe. And we have also a massive glacier, which is similar to a permafrost that you can find in Siberia. It's the only one in Western Europe. And, uh, but at the same time, we are in the south. So climate-wise, this is obviously an ideal condition to produce high-quality wines because you have climates and soils and altitudes that clash together in a very short distance. And uh, within Abruzzo, uh, the history of winemaking um, is, of quality winemaking, I would say, is fairly recent because um, the first quality wines in the region appeared maybe 20 years ago. And they appeared thanks to a winery Masciarelli, where well, I had the privilege of working for quite a bit. And even before joining Masciarelli, I've been representing the wines of the UK, as Ali knows, for a long, long, long time. So uh, let's say wine-wise, 
the scene of Abruzzo is still dominated by very large or medium-sized cooperatives. Uh, the private uh, growers that made themselves independent from uh, large cooperatives is, uh, as I mentioned, a, a relatively recent story. And Masciarelli is probably by a long way the most important of them. And he's the one that really put the region on the map of quality wines of Italy in a first instance and of quality wines of the world in a second instance. Um, now, the, the estate Masciarelli that also has Valori as a sister estate, uh, let's say is the largest privately owned estate in the region. So Masciarelli owns uh, about 320 hectares of vines. However, you don't need to consider Masciarelli like the classic large estate with a lot of land around a castle or around a house or around a property. It is a puzzle of a dozens of very small vineyards and medium-sized vineyards. We own in total 67 vineyards and they stretch uh, between the north and the south of the region. Some of these are about 350, 370 kilometers apart from each other and uh, the terroirs are extremely, extremely different. They go from a size of one hectare to 40 hectares and each one is managed individually. So uh, the reason of success of Machete that started uh, in, um, in the mid 80s with only 1.5 hectare just around the house where Gianni Masciarelli was born uh, is based on the fact that he's been the first one believing in the idea of developing the wines of the region by terroir, not just by variety. And that really uh, allowed him to present on the wine scene a really wide and diverse range of wines based on varieties like Trebbiano, Montepulciano and Pecorino. They were before considered very, how can I say, boring, uninteresting, even neutral. Uh, obviously, well, grapes that could give lots of generosity in terms of sugars and alcohol, but not really interesting for the palate that wants to enjoy something particular. So he was completely against the idea of the traditional vision of wines from Abruzzo. And therefore, he started exploring the different terroirs of the region, uh, exploring the different clones of the varieties that are planted there, and starting to adapt the grapes that he was planting to the place where they had to be planted subsequently also starting to vinify the grapes in really different ways according to the place. So each one of our 67 vineyards is uh, treated manually by a team of people that focuses only on that specific terroir. We have four main terroirs in Abruzzo. We'll get to that a bit later. And uh, is vinified according to the soil in and according to the place. We also have four different vinification facilities, if you want to call them like this, each one devoted only to the grapes made in a specific area of the region. Because as Ali was mentioning, we stretch from really, really high and, uh, and quite cold mountains uh, where um, you have sometimes the snow around you still in the summer. And vineyards there obviously benefit from extreme high altitude going up to eight to 900 meters. And you have snow all around the place and you have really cold wind. But then in 30, 35 minutes, you are on the beach. And there it's really hot. It's really sunny and really South Italian in a way. But at the same time, if you look again at the map, the coastline of Abruzzo is facing east. So although we are very close to Tuscany and Lazio, there is a spine of mountains in between and the eastern coast faces obviously Eastern Europe. So we have really cold winds blowing from Russia, Ukraine and former Yugoslavia directly into Abruzzo. Whereas on the other side where Tuscany is, you have really hot and warm wind blowing from Africa and from Spain. So the climatic conditions are extremely different. And, uh, and that is for us a real blessing. So Darius, uh, with, just a question with, with that is, so. Does this Pecorino come from higher altitude vineyards then? 
So the pecorino uh, of Castello di Semivicoli comes from an altitude of 450 meters. We are on a hill, uh, which is just the one where the, uh, our castle sits. This is our beautiful guest house, by the way, where the guys have been and where I hope I'll be able to welcome you all at some point. Yeah, this is a, a big hill, uh, about 40 minutes inland from the coast. It is uh, so medium high altitude, but it is really on the border between the two climates because in there you have still lots of winds from the mountains, but it is really the limit where the Mediterranean winds manage to arrive. So the interesting climatic thing about this pecorino is that both climates clash together exactly in that point. And, uh, and also the hill, which is quite high, as I said, is made mostly out of, uh, of chalk which is a soil that is devoted to acidity and freshness. So you don't have just a structure, which is typical in southern Italy, but you also have this massive freshness. So it can be considered um, a mountain wine, although we are not exactly on the highest mountains where vines are produced in Abruzzo. Yes. Okay, cool. And I think it'd be interesting to see any thoughts that... Thank, thanks, Daria, that's, that's amazing information. It'd be interesting to see any thoughts on the Pecorino, because I think, as, as you can see on the slide here, um, we, we've got a sort of question for, for Daria and myself, you know, why, I probably think it's fair to say Pecorino is one of the trendiest grapes um, in Italy at Absolutely. the moment, it has been over the past few years, and there's been a massive um, uh, increase in, in interest from it. And I, I personally love Pecorino, and I, I think my answer to this, and I think it would be really interesting to see what Daria says, is that it's, it's a grape that's naturally high in acidity, Yep. Um, and it can accumulate sugars fairly, fairly well. So it's got richness and texture as well as that. But it's a semi-aromatic grape variety. So I think there's a, maybe a backlash globally. And I, I know you've had this in Australia against the very aromatic Sauvignon Blanc. So I think this kind of more mineral, subtle, elegant wine, but still high in that freshness is the reason why it's gained in popularity and will continue to do so. What, what are your thoughts, Derek? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Ali. Uh, and on top of that, I would also say that personally, I am really in love with this variety. I've been in love with this variety for many years. I found it not just, um, let's say, an intense and semi-aromatic, as you say, wine, but also a very versatile variety because Pecorino, due mm. to its, um, nat let's say, natural character, richness and acidity, ability to give structure and also give good, good levels of sugars, in a way adapts and variates a lot according to the vintage. And at Machale, this is something that we really like to develop. So the Pecorino will never ever be the same vintage after vintage. It will always follow the climatic pattern that uh, where the vines have been growing. Uh, in some vintages, you will see a Pecorino that is really pale, transparent, uh, really fresh and a bit more aromatic maybe. In other vintages, you will see a uh, pecorino that is golden, rich, structured, yeah. more even buttery because in these vintages we like to leave the wine a bit longer in contact with fine leaves. And therefore there is a, a variation vintage after vintage, which to me it is, is really one of the great advantages of this variety in terms of flexibility. And it's really one of the reasons that made it so popular because with Pecorino you can really go in every possible direction. And I think it's fabulous. And yeah, Daria, makes, just to jump in there, we've got a question um, about aging the yeah. Pecorino. Does, does Pecorino perform well in the cellar? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, no problem with that. Uh, Pecorino Castello di Semivicoli is, of course, also one of the most important pecorinos produced in the region. It is a wine that we have started producing uh, 12 years ago, and you can still taste the first vintages without any problem. I mean, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, we also tried a few for dinner when we were up in uh, Guardia Grela, if you guys remember. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, even with four or five years of age, the wine is absolutely fresh and uh, uh, the, the one I remember was actually developing a quite interesting, slightly tropical note on it, uh, which is maybe even a bit different from what I expected, but uh, the one absolutely ages without any problem. Then obviously you need to take into consideration we're talking about Pecorino of, let's say, premium level, not uh, an entry level one made by a cooperative where obviously you have a couple of, a couple of years uh, drinkability. If yeah. If I could just give my, my two cents from, from an Australian perspective for, for a lot of our, our local drinkers here, 
for those of you who have been to the Hunter Valley and who would know the wines of the Hunter Valley, I still, I do definitely remember that night, Dario. And I remember trying a wine and that, that it was quite exquisitely tropical. And it reminded me quite clearly of, uh, of a Vidello, of a Hunter Valley Vidello. It had that, that okay. quality, but with a really nice fine line of acidity underneath it. So for those of you who are, who are thinking of what, what could I equate that to from a local perspective that would, it, I would see, I would say a Vidello definitely would be a good option, but we, we're, we're kind of talking around the topic, but I would say this is, I mean, this is to me, this is getting fairly close to a Chardonnay-esque style of wine as well, which is, I think why it's, it's answering that question. That's why it gets, it's gaining popularity in the last few years. So. Yeah. Well, Gorgeous. that's a great compliment. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> We, we're just going to, I'm going to move on. So this is a beautiful picture of the Castello di Simivicoli. And, um, and I do honestly encourage you, anyone who has, has even the, the slightest thought of visiting Abruzzo, this has to be on your list of, of places to go. It is one of the most gorgeous places in the world. But we have a question for you, Dario. And it's yep. from, uh, from one, of our, one of our guests here, Fred, this evening. And he said, how does Verdicchio from Castelli di Gesi differ from Pecorino? Yeah, okay. So, uh, the uh, Verdicchio from... Okay, it's, it's good that you point at Castelli di Gesi because it's not the only appellation of uh, Verdicchio existing, although it's the biggest and the most popular. So, it's, it's a good comparison, I think. So, Verdicchio in general... Uh, let's say in a classic vintage because obviously there is vintage variation and this is not let's say a rule but i would say in a generic way verdicchio normally has got a bit less structure than a pecorino has got uh let's say a level of acidity that can be as high as a pecorino or vice versa however the uh, uh, varietal character of verdicchio is quite different from pecorino mm -hmm. starting from the nose where uh Verdicchio starts always pretty much on the yellow white fruits and develops over the years in a kind of Riesling-ish, nearly petroly aromatic direction, whereas Pecorino preserves an initial fruit quite uh, constantly and evolves in a more kind of tropical uh, ripe fruitiness over the years. So the, uh, the evolution of the wines is really different. So let's say uh, Verdicchio tends to go quite Nordic in a way with a bit of age, whereas Pecorino preserves a uh, typicity of fruit that is quintessential Italian, I would say. Yeah, perfect. And, and Fred, I hope that, um, that answers your question. Now, we, uh, I see a lot of empty glasses here, so let's get into our second wine. Just one last question, if we could. Uh, yeah, of has this, what, what, what's been the wood treatment or the barrel treatment of this wine? Mm. So in uh, Pecorino Castello has got no wood treatment at all. The wine is vinified in stainless steel. It's aged in stainless steel only but there is a lot of contact on fine leaves. So the leaves are kept in the bottle, uh, sorry, in the tanks, just until a few weeks before bottling where the wine is uh, well, wrapped off from the, leaf, from, the, from the fine leaves and left on its own on a tank prior to bottling for two, three weeks. So uh, the creamy butteriness you get, it has nothing to do with oak contact. It's purely made by the leaves that are indigenous uh, in the wine. So we're looking that, more shabbily than we are. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I was going back to your comment, Mark, about uh, Chardonnay-like, and, and I thought it was the same, but uh, without any wood, obvious wood character. And that's been yep. really fun. Thank you for that. Yeah, fantastic. So Pleasure. we're just going to, we're going to move on to our second wine for this evening, which is the Valori Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. Now, again, as Ali, as Ali hinted at earlier this evening, the, we're talking about the variety, not the region this time. Last time we were talking about the place, now we're talking about the grape variety. So it is uh, after Sangiovese, Montepulciano is one of the most prolific varieties, in, uh, especially in central and southern Italy. It, uh, it's allowed in 20 DOCs and DOCGs throughout, throughout Italy. 
but it is very, very late ripening. So it prefers the warmer climates. So I'll throw back to, to Dario to give us a, a brief introduction about the winery Valori, the producer Valori, yep. and the, the lovely man that makes these wines. So Luigi Valori, AKA the man, <laughs> is a really good friend of ours. And uh, yeah, <laughs> he's been working very closely to Gianni Masciarelli since day one. He is an agronomist and he learned enology by practice, not in school. And uh, initially, they, uh, the ch these two men that are two, probably the most important men in the history of wines, modern history of wines of the region, uh, they met for dinner, uh, at a dinner between a dozen of growers, where Gianni Machere, that was already a celebrity, at some point decided to stand up and say, guys, I'm sorry, I cannot drink any of these wines. There is only one that I like. It's this one. Who's the man that makes it? So Luigi lifts his hand. That's me, Mr. Masciarelli. And uh, at the time, they were still quite young, in their 30s. And uh, so there was the beginning of, a, let's say, story of love, <laughs> history of love between them. So uh, Luigi Valori at the time uh, had uh, a bit of land, was producing bulk wines and then selling the wine to a local cooperative. He was not bottling it. So it was just uh, a sample of juice that he was selling to the, to the cooperative of Teramo that he presented. But then Gianni, uh, decided to uh, join forces with him. He hired him to help him uh, developing the uh, agro agronomical part of the business. And he also helped him uh, developing his own estate. So uh, today, after more than 20 years, Luigi Valori and Masciarelli are really sister estates, not because of the ownership of one or the other, but because of an alliance these two men have created. So the terroirs between Masciarelli and Valori are extremely different. Uh, not, not sure if it's possible maybe to show the map again, but uh, yeah. Valori is on the northern edge of region Abruzzo. So it's the last uh, large borough just before the borders with Marche. So you see it's on the top, where, near the little hand, exactly. That is the province of Teramo. And uh, Valori is really at the, bo at the northern border of Teramo, very close to the coast in the little triangle there, let's say, mm -hmm. exactly up there. And uh, we are probably five minutes drive or less from the coast. We are three minutes drive from Marche. And we are on, on uh, low hills made out of sand, purely sand. So the soils are completely different from uh, the area in the central southern Abruzzo, where Marcelli is based, where the soils are mostly uh, clay, limestone, and they have lots of rocks. Over there, it's completely uh, fragmented and poor sand. And we are much closer to the coastline than we are at Masciarelli. So this is the first difference. Second difference is a really, really windy area where eastern winds hit the, the winery immediately because we are just facing the coast. So it's like a wall where the wind coming from former Yugoslavia and Eastern Europe hits the vineyards. Uh, and uh, uh, there is as a result, a very specific character in the Montepulciano from that part of Abruzzo. Because Montepulciano is known for being a really rich, uh, exuberant, uh, productive variety. But in Teramo, uh, the varietal character of Montepulciano is slightly different because it is considered the area of finesse for this variety. So you never achieve the structure you have in other parts. You have much more freshness and a very distinctive delicacy that I hope you are enjoying in your glass. Mm -hmm. And Luigi is really the master in, in, in Teramo, on our opinion. He's been the very first one that has been interpreting in the right way the specific character of the terroirs. You know, Teramo in the past was always considered an extremely generous region or district in terms of food diversity. It is the city in the world with a, with a very interesting record because Teramo itself has got 75 indigenous recipes that you find only in that city. So it's, it's, it's got the 
biggest uh, food heritage in the world. So they pride themselves about this. So 75 recipes in only one town that you find only that is a bit of a Guinness record, I guess. And, uh, but wine wise, it was always considered uninteresting. The Montepulciano was watery, flabby, light. So mm. not really good in the sense of a traditional drinker. But then people like Valori really understood the potential of it. And today, it is not a coincidence. It is also the only area of Montepulciano variety where there is a DOCG appellation. So a superior level of quality, which is something you don't find in the rest of Abruzzo, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to, to tie into yours, this is the only Montepulciano that we United Sellers bring into this country. So it's obviously a bit of a favourite. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's lovely wine. So, Ali, I'm just going to throw over to you, if that's all right. I've, um, I've put a question in here that I think a lot of our, a lot of our guests here tonight would be interested in. Montepulciano, I have seen a handful of them popping up in other different parts of the world. Where do you think it would, from a pro professional master of wine perspective, where do you think it might grow well? It's a good question. Uh, you know, thinking of it sort of simply as a, as a grape variety, it's a grape variety that is very brambly, forest fruity. It's, it's robustly fruity. It also has a tendency to be um, what they call reductive. So it needs a lot of oxygen in there because some of them can be quite smelly and stinky. Um, yeah. yeah. And so it's a grape variety that needs quite a lot of, of, of attention in the in the winery itself um i think it's an underrated great variety it makes some really complex wines but it can also make some really fantastic glugging wines which is what it's become famous for so likely you know things like the coke de rhone maybe you could could think of it as being similar where would it grow well um wow do you know what that's a good question i think uh i've i've seen it grown pretty well in chile actually by a couple of producers um oh. very very small scale um so i think it it certainly is a great variety that can cope with with sunshine and warmth um i'm thinking in australia where it could grow well I um, memory, it tends to like the water it doesn't like drought too well so it'd have to be a region that kind of likes the that has a little bit of water available yeah so would it would it work down in in Victoria? Potentially, so. But I was thinking somewhere like Tasmania might be an interesting place. To ah, I quite agree. I quite agree with this. Tasmania, interesting. Hmm. Would it yeah. not be too cool climate there? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it does get it does get bloody sunny down there. It gets it hits forty yeah, degrees yeah, yeah. without uh, any doubt. But yeah, potentially in the spring, oh. in the uh, spring and the autumn, yeah. But where, if where I may intervene. If I may intervene, I quite agree with the uh, uh, suggestion of, uh, of Tasmania. Uh, and one of the reasons why I believe it could work is that uh, Montepulciano has been tested. Or maybe Adelaide Hills. Yeah, of course. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basket Hills, rain. Fantastic call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That, yeah. Cool. Mornington Peninsula, maybe. Yeah. How about Mornington Peninsula? Mornington, absolutely. Well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, what, um, what I was trying to say, uh, Montepulciano, like many other Italian varieties, has been tested a bit everywhere, from California to obviously South America. I tried some from Marlboro as well, which oh, is wow. interesting. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which was interesting, and uh, but probably not the best result, though. And... Uh, I, I think the reason why not so much Montepulciano has to be found out of its native districts or areas is that obviously it copes well with the sun. Um, it is uh, a bit reductive, which is something that sometimes winemakers don't like because it's, a, it's an extra hassle in the cellar. But uh, the main reason why Montepulciano never really picked up out of, outside of its native area is that the variety is incredibly delicate and fragile. Obviously, you are from a, from a wine that is dark, rich in tannins, can give good structure. You expect something quite solid and rich, but it is absolutely the opposite. Montepulciano mm -hmm. performs well 
in Abruzzo because it's a sunny and hot area. But as I was mentioning, and I will get back to that more and more, the really cold winds that hit the region from east preserve uh, Monte Pulciano. Mm. Uh, Luigi itself has tested Monte Pulciano in Tuscany, not in Monte Pulciano, Tuscany, but in Chianti, Tuscany. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> exactly. Monte Pulciano from Monte Pulciano. <laughs> but it didn't work at all. Over there, it's the, the winds are too warm and humid. So what happens there is that the vines go rotten very, very, very quickly. So they go rotten before achieving maturity because also Monte Pulciano is a very late ripening variety. And therefore, in a humid uh, area, it will not work. So that's For that reason, I, I was pointing at Mornington Peninsula or Tasmania because they have ideal climate conditions for late ripening red varieties. And lots of breezes that will keep the disease down. And lots and of breezes. Francesco, just to answer your question, you, he's put in here, why not Barossa? I think Dario has just answered that question. There would be too much warmth, too much humidity, yep. and it would, it would potentially... Um, yeah, it would potentially cook the wines and make them a little bit, a little bit disease prone. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. It is coast area as well, right? Cut close to the sea, sandy soils. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely. Yep. So just to just to give you guys a bit of a head, so there there is. I have tasted some from Heathkit, which has been very interesting as well. That's got the hot days, cooler nights. Uh, mountain breezes, abundant winter rainfall. So that, that works well. Um, some friend, friends of ours from Chalmers, Kim Chalmers, makes a, um, a Monte Pulciano from, from Heathkit. So that's, a, that, that's another, another one to think of. So yeah, orange, ben, ben said, orange potentially. Yeah, that stays, that's got, that's, that, might, that might even be too cool, to be honest. That might even be mm. too cool in orange, yeah. So but anyway, we've, we've got a few empty glasses here. So we're going to move on to our next um, um, cognizant of the time here. We're going to move on to the our next uh, region. So we've gone from central um, Italy. We've gone through the mountains. We've gone to the sea down by Pescara. Now we're going to go right down to the very south, to the southernmost island of Italy, to Sicily. So Ali, I was going to get, I was going to throw over to you if that's all right, to give us a sure. bit of an idea about about your your thoughts on Sicily first of all, in a few words. Yeah, no problem. I'll give a, a brief intro, and then and then it'd be great to get Dario's thoughts as well, because this he, he's he's been involved in projects I know in Sicily as well. So just a broad sort of snapshot of Sicily and the wine industry. So Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean, and it's also got the largest area of vines in Italy, about 110, 115 thousand. Um, however, it's got the lowest volume of DOC wine. So DOC, I think we've talked about that, essentially is a wine of quality. Um, so very high production and quite an Italian sort of story here. You know, a lot of uh, essentially favoring volume over, over quality. Um, and, but again, as we've seen with Montepulciano, uh, with Abruzzo, sorry, in the past 20 to 30 years, probably 40 to 50, but more 20 to 30, there has definitely been a drive towards higher quality wines in specific parts of Sicily. So the vast majority of wines produced in Sicily for this extremely hot climate, surprisingly, is white made from a grape called Cateratto, which can be really not that interesting in all honesty. Um, a lot of it can, well, some of it historically has gone into producing some of the bulk Masala wines that are produced in Italy, which is essentially a fortified wine um, sort of cross between sh sherry and Madeira, put quite simply. Um, so Sicily, a warm region. I think the best way to think of Sicily is from going east to west. So if you see on the east here, um, Mark, can you point down to Mount Etna? Okay, so this part here, Mount Etna, has by far and is by far the home of the highest quality wines, in my opinion, in Sicily. And that's really only been since probably about the 1980s. And here on the volcanic slopes of Mount Etna, up to altitudes of about 1,100 meters, it's the coolest part of Sicily. And is, as I say, 
produces the greatest wines, predominantly red and predominantly on uh, by a, a grape called Norella Mascalese that we will talk about um, in a little bit. Um, and then as you go further, the, the greatest Nero Diavolas come from down in the bottom in where you can see Syracuse around there. That's where the, the, the best yeah, Nero Diavolas come. As you go towards the center of Sicily, so moving towards the, the west, it's getting, getting warmer. And here we've got home to some, some really great wineries, one called Planeta, Donna Fugata, um, which produce some very high quality wines. And we see more um, international grape varieties here as well. Syrah and Merlot have done quite well. Um, so some really good quality wines, but also some, some patchy ones. And then as we go towards the west and up here in Trapani in the, in the, in the northwest, this is where it's sent a lot of high bulk um, Catarato wines that have gone into Masala. You can see the name of Masala there. Um, the other way, great varieties to think of in Sicily are Inzolia and Grillo, which are higher quality wines essentially than Catarato. But Nero d'Avola that we'll talk about now is the most highly planted uh, red grape, certainly. And then we mustn't forget this lovely little island down here of Pantelleria. Um, where I think they produce some of the greatest sweet wines, sweet muscat wines that there are, producing called Ben Raye and their Pasita de Pantelleria is a wine to really look out for if you can. Um, but the interesting thing, so we've gone from the, the cooler east, um, yeah, cooler east to the warmer west. And in the west here, so Masala and Trapani are closer to Tunis in Tunisia than they are to Naples. So here you've got really warm winds coming in from the African continent. So here really is warm and on the east is certainly a lot cooler. So we've got the Nero Davila in the glass. Um, be interesting to see what you guys think. Darren, have you got anything you want to add briefly to, to that and then maybe about Nero Davila? Yeah, so um, yeah, you covered kind of in, in detail most of Sicily. Of, of, co of course, Italians tend to call Sicily a little continent. Uh, because uh, it is obviously the largest island in the Mediterranean, but still a, a region of the country, but the region with one of the biggest diversities in it, in terms of altitude and climates. If you really are on Etna or in the surroundings of Etna, you feel, uh, especially if you are in the northern slopes, a bit more in Switzerland than um, in Italy. Whereas uh, if you move west, you really feel northern Africa completely. And it is just a few hours drive. So this is one of the magics of Sicily. Then obviously, uh, the long history and the waves of colonizations and invasions that uh, have populated uh, Sicily over thousands of years brought in lots, lots of different cultures and influences from all around the world. I mean, of course, Sicily has been ruled by the Normans, by the Spanish, by the Arabs, by the Romans, the Byzantines. Uh, they have a, an, another interesting record in Palermo. It is the most invaded city in history. So uh, every population, probably except even Australians in the Second World War, invaded Palermo. So everywhere. <laughs> so uh, it is difficult to point out who has not occupied Palermo in history. And everyone brought a bit of history with him. The Anjou brought uh, varieties. Uh, the uh, Romans brought varieties. The Greeks brought varieties. The Phoenicians brought varieties. So the heritage is really absolutely incredible. And uh, th there's been in Sicily a bit of a bubble of so-called international varieties in the 80s and early 90s that firstly brought Sicily on the map of, let's say, quality wines, where uh, large estates started producing lots of Shiraz, lots of Chardonnay, and uh, lots of Cabernet Sauvignon. But then, especially also with other much larger uh, new world countries emerging, obviously Australia as well, they realized they were going completely in the different direction. So the uh, many smart growers started understanding that they had this dormant heritage that had to be brought back to life. And this is really where the revolution of quality wines in Sicily started. The revolution is still on its way because it, there's a long way to go. And as Ali was mentioning, most of the wine there is still bulk wine. But I think Sicily has got a bright future ahead. Uh, Nero Davol itself, it is a local variety that was yeah. born in the region around Syracuse in the Southeast. According to some, it is even a forefather of Syrah that apparently arrived from Sicily to southern France, but nobody really knows. 
and genetically there's not many similarities between the two. However, uh, it is a variety that really develops in a specific direction that sometimes can have something in common with it. Uh, Nero Davola then spread across the region, but in a very recent time, because uh, it's only 15 years maybe that Nero Davola started being planted elsewhere. Until the 80s, it was really local. There was barely any Nero Davola in the whole West where still white grapes dominate, but Nero Davola is now really the most well-known and widely planted grape in the region, although it is something fairly recent outside of Syracuse district. I think, isn't it, it it's an interesting grape variety as, as we've looked at with Pecorino, um, Pecorino and Vidicchio, we talked about naturally high in acidity. Nero Davila, why it does so well, I believe in, in Sicily is because it is a grape variety that actually has huge amounts of acidity often um yeah. which means it can cope in these really the, the warm climate of um of sicily and there is there are certainly these these um lightnesses to 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 syrah this brambly smoky character and again it's another great we talked about that technical word of reductive in in multiple china it's the same with this it needs quite a lot of air to 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 stop it getting that stinky um, smelly character, but I think you've you've been involved in the Nero Davola project, haven't you, there, Dario? Yeah, 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 yeah. We uh, we are involved in a Nero Davola project in the West, actually, in the white wine country, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we are produ we are producing there some uh, uh, some Nero Davola on uh, on rich soils made out of clay, and uh, yeah. The one is uh, surprisingly, because it's so hot over there and arid, surprisingly light and ethereal. And it yeah. goes in a very distinctive fruit direction, which I quite like. And it's, I would say, quite typical Southern Italian, but it is really super size over there, which is this kind of sour, cherry, cherry. Absolutely. dryness. So kind of dried herbal sour cherry something like that which is really amazing to me it really fills your nose of uh, w with fruits and uh, yeah. and slightly balsamic notes as well so it is sometimes a very easy drinking wine but there is so much going on in the nose and that is probably one of the reasons why Nero Davo is so successful and yeah. just to um and, and and Luke brought up a really really good point there and I, I'm kind of hinting at it with the slide here about it it has many of the same characteristics of Syrah, Shiraz. One of the reasons why I think, well, I know one of the reasons why I, I love it as a wine, but I know many of our customers love Nero Davola is because it does have a, you, you can easily take a, take a similarity. You can pick up a similarity between Nero Davola and, and come some, some of the lighter Syrah-esque yeah. Shiraz wines. I mean, this, more, more the lightest, I would say. Yeah. yeah I mean, this one, one, one thing to keep in mind with this wine despite it being quite a robust, big, round wine, which I think it definitely is, especially in comparison to, to the multiple channel, is this is 13% alcohol. This is not 14 and a half big, round, ballsy, punch you in the mouth. It's, it's quite a 13% for an, from an Australian perspective is actually relatively in check. So it's, it, it balances that warmth and, and robustness of fruit with a relatively light touch. So jump in there mark uh, obviously we've, we've gone through the, the three wines here um and everyone's been drinking you know nice and, and quietly really keen to to open up the floor and see if anyone's interested in in you know sharing their thoughts especially on the the nero whilst we're on it has there been anything that's kind of jumped out to people um you can un unmute or jump on the chat and and let us know i can always voice you a question but so uh, yeah absolutely and then, please, guys, please, please do, please do get your questions out there. But while while you're thinking of them, or while you're typing your, your questions out here, we've got a guest question as well. We've had another question over the over the week, so this is great. Coming into week four, everyone's knows what's coming up and knows the knows how things are going. So they're asking questions, which is great. So what is I'm going to ask both Dario and and Ali, what is Nerello? And because we've got the two Nerelli, I should say, yeah. Nerello Mascalese and Nerello Capuccio. So mm -hmm. we, they're, they're in Australia, at least I know, they're actually really hard to get your hands on at the moment. They yeah. they're really are. They're the hot topic. They're the hot button items. And 
I think our, our guest here has asked, you know, what, what's the, what are they? What's the difference? Give us a bit of a, a rundown of what they might taste like. And then we can, um, yeah, and what are the differences? Cool. I'll say, I'll say a couple of words and then pass over to, to Dario, who, who, who may okay. know better. But essentially, the Norello Mascalese is, is by far considered the, the more superior grape of the two. And when you're thinking of, of what might it be most similar to, I would say probably a cross between Nebbiolo and Pinot Noir. So that more delicate fruit character, um, more on the red fruit spectrum, good acidity, firm, but approachable tannin. So it's a grape that does well in its youth, um, but can also age exceptionally well. Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting point is actually before um, Norello Mascalese became what it was and became popular, the largest, apparently, I, I've heard that the largest purchasers of Norello Mascalese were actually the producers of Barolo, who were coming down and buying it to, uh, to blend away into their wines. That, that wouldn't surprise me if that's true. So I'd say Norello Mascalese is, is the noble of the two. And we could probably liken Capuccio to, to being the Merlot, to, to the Merlot counterpart to Mascalese's Cabernet, if that makes any sense. So it's a grape that's more similar to Carignan. It's a grape that's got, um, it, it's moderate in color. Um, it's softer, probably less interesting, and is far better. It is nearly always a blending grape. So it never plays, um, you know, top fiddle. It's always sort of playing second fiddle to, to Mascalese. What do you think, Dario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I... I completely agree with what you mentioned about the two varieties. So Nerello Mascalese, uh, a very noble variety in a way, uh, grows only on altitude. So another difference with Nero Davola is that Nero Davola on a mountain area similar to Etna will never ever perform. Uh, there's been some attempt to blend also Nero, Nero Davola and Nerello Mascalese. Uh, I think that the tests have been a complete disaster and uh, I think they should just give up on that because they have nothing to do between each other. And uh, so uh, Nero Davola grows normally on low altitude on uh, quite uh, sunny hills and it struggles to cope with cool, very cool climate actually. Whereas Nerello Mascalese performs at its best on altitude. Take into account that the average harvesting season for reds, not for whites, for reds on Etna, goes between mid-October and mid-November, which is extremely late. So we're talking about the latest red crops harvested in Europe. And uh, that speaks for the uh, character of uh, Nerello Mascalese a lot. Then I absolutely agree with the, with the character that can be something in between Nebbiolo-ish and maybe Pinot Noir-ish in a floral way. Obviously, uh, it is probably a bit more intense than a Nebbiolo. Uh, and, uh, but the floral character that you find in Piemont is sometimes to be found also on Nerello Mascalese. Although you have there a bit more of undergrowth and uh, different types of fruits as well. Uh, acidity, again, very high color, really, really transparent, which is completely different from Nero Davola, again, where the color is super intense. But uh, a good Nero Mascalese is always very transparent and, uh, and delicate in a way. Aging potential is phenomenal, much more than a Nero Davola. A good Nero Mascalese will really age as well as a good uh, Barolo or a good Pinot Noir. Obviously, there's very few growers that started making high quality Nello Mascalese uh, in the long past. Therefore, we don't have yet the evidence that it can age, let's say, 40 years like a great Barolo. But I think we'll talk about this again in another 15 or 20 years when the high quality Nello Mascalese will reach the age of wisdom, which is not there yet for most of them. And, uh, yeah, moreover... Yeah, interesting sorry? enough, Dario. We... Um... There's, there's actually a lot of Nerello Mascalese in in quarantine currently being grown to, I think it's still a few years off being released, but there's there are many, many growers in Australia who, who are very, very keen to get their hands on 
making Nerello Moscalese in, in Australia as well. So that's, that's very it interesting. Is a, it's, it's a clever plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas uh, Nerello Cappuccio, it's, yeah, it's quite different. It is normally uh, considered a, a complementary grape to Nerello Mascalese because it is quite different in character, slightly richer on color, slightly more textured. The tannic structure is really different. Uh, it's also well, well pointed that uh, there is lots of similarity between Nerello Cappuccio and Carignan sometimes. Mm -hmm. Even genetically speaking, there is some sign of Carignan. In, uh, between the ancestors of Narello Cappuccio, but nobody really exactly knows where the variety arrived from. What is clear is that Narello Mascalese is completely indigenous on Etna. Narello Cappuccio arrived or has been crossed at some point coming from somewhere else, but nobody exactly knows where from. Yeah, but it, it is also quite interesting that you find more and more Narello Mascalese single varietal very, very few. Maybe I, I remember only one in my life that uh, is a single variety of Narello Cappuccio, and that means a lot. Yeah, interesting, fantastic. So let's um, let's. Uh, I've put it on this page here just as a quick uh, uh, run back across what we where we've been, and we are going to give you guys a couple of minutes while I wrap everything up to text in your favorite and Luke's collating all of the, all of your answers there. And he's going to, he's going to pick a name out of the hat, so to speak. But I just wanted to put all of these ones in front of you here to show you how kind of how far we've come. I'm very, very proud of how far we've come here. And again, my thanks to obviously to, to Ali who has been instrumental in educating us more about these wines to entertaining us with his with his his british wit of course and of course thank you this week to dario we've been so fortunate thank you guys such fantastic guests these past few weeks and hopefully we'll be having many 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 more so he again here are the wines we've tasted week one we were up in the north in the the northeast we went through prosecco pinot grigio valpolicella then we shot across over to the west, the northwest, and we tried some, some wines from the region of Piedmont. We then went down into Tuscany, tried Sangiovese in all its different forms, and this week a much broader region as we head into the south, Pecorino for the whites, Mon uh, Montepulciano for the reds, and of course Nero from, from Sicily. So I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. We're just going to go back here. I mean, we... We've covered so much, but there's so much more that we could have covered, obviously, you know, and, and Dario and Ali, of course, you could give a million more things that we could have done over these past few weeks. It really honestly was genuinely, genuinely very difficult for me to narrow down where we wanted to actually visit to give a broad enough idea of what Italy was. And, you know, Vermentino from Sardinia, Primitivo from Puglia, you know, this is this is where Zinfandel of the Americas, this is where it comes from, you know, Fiano from Campania, Italian Chardonnay, as I call it, it's absolutely gorgeous. So we, we honestly, we could do a year's worth of tastings in just in Italy, but we're going to cap it at four weeks. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming along on the journey. We're, we're just about to hit our hour here, but I'm going to throw across to Luke. Uh, Luke, have you got all of the uh, all the names coming in? Got a lot of names, which has been amazing to see. Actually, I was quite surprised by the amount of names we've got going. So, what I'm going to do is a bit of a throwback to um, the Wheel of Fortune. I hope everyone can see my screen here. Here we go. Ooh. We've got the oh, names. Have we got them? Yeah, brilliant. So I'm going to spin this and. Uh, yeah, good luck to everybody. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, look at that. How good is this? <laughs> oh. Ben, well done. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Ben Crossing, we have a winner. Well done. Amazing. Ben, I'll be in contact and we can sort that out for you, okay? Fantastic. Thank you, Luke. That's awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being a part 
of not only this evening, but the past month. It's, it's been an incredible learning experience for us. And I really, I truly, truly, truly hope that you have been entertained and uh, informed about the wines we like about uh, over these last couple of weeks. So I thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for me as well. To everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Mario, <laughs> thank you. Mario, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So good to have you. And Mario, thanks, buddy. Catch up soon. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Yeah, very soon, I hope. Huh? Thanks, Red Skiers, before the next one. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Guys, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, everybody. Luke, very well done. Organize more. We want more. Ha <laughs> <laughs> regions in Italy, please. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Cheers.